Our sermon text this morning is 2 Kings 2, 13 to 25. And he took up the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he had struck the water, the water was parted to the one side and to the other, and Elisha went over. Now when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho saw him opposite them, they said, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. And they said to him, Behold now, there are with your servants fifty strong men. Please let them go and seek your master. It may be that the Spirit of the Lord has caught him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. And he said, You shall not send. But when they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, Send. They sent, therefore, fifty men, and for three days they sought him, but did not find him. And they came back to him while he was staying at Jericho, and he said to them, Did I not say to you, Do not go? Now the men of the city said to Elisha, Behold, the situation of the city is pleasant, as my Lord sees, but the water is bad, and the land is unfruitful. He said, Bring me a new bowl, and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went to the spring of water, and threw salt in it, and said, Thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From now on, neither death nor miscarriage shall come upon it. So the water has been healed to this day, according to the word that Elijah spoke. He went up from there to Bethel, and while he was going on the way, some small boys came out of the city and jeered at him, saying, Go up, you bald head! Go up, you bald head! And he turned around, and he saw them, and he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two she-bears came out of the woods and tore forty-two of the boys. From there he went on to Mount Carmel, and from there he returned to Samaria. Please be seated. Welcome to our summer sermon series. We are no longer in Matthew's gospel, can you tell? Things just got weird, summer has begun, and we are beginning a new series. Uh, yeah, and so this is also sort of unique. We've got um, bears uh, mauling boys in our text this morning, and we have grade school kids in the room, because that's what we do on summer long weekends. And so <clears throat> my commitment is I'm going to try to make this as G-rated as possible, but that is likely going to be in the sort of Bambi movie kind of way, you know? Uh, so uh, for some of the kids in the room, though, you hear a story like that, and you're thinking, like, sweet, bears, right? And others of us are sort of wondering, like, why Elisha responds so strongly to a bald joke, right? And then there are others in the room. I think the bald men in the room are thinking, finally, sweet justice, right? Pretty sure that's what's happening. Is that right, Tyson? Oh, there you go. All right, now, without a doubt, uh, this is one of the oddest texts in Scripture. Um, and, you know, to be honest, if you, if you really look at what's going on, it's one of the most troubling texts in the whole Bible. When you come across texts like this, stories in the Bible about things that are, irk you a little bit, trouble you, what's your response? What do you do? Uh, there's really two responses you can have. One is to sort of just avoid stories like this. I don't know what to do with it. I'm just going to set it aside. That is strange. That is odd. It's troubling. I'm going to avoid it. Or the other response we can have is we can study it. And because we are in 2 Kings and looking at a text like this, you can probably guess what my response is. It's, I think we should study texts like this. Um, I read a story of a young pastor dad recently uh, who just became a father, had this newborn infant daughter, 
you know, wonderful experience for him and his wife. And one of the things that he had been really looking forward to was just reading her Bible stories, reading her stories. And so this, you know, she's a newborn and he's got her in his arm, sitting in the rocking chair in the nursery. And he grabs this book that he intentionally bought by one of his favorite 19th century preachers, J.C. Ryle, such a pastor thing to do. And it's called Children's Stories by J.C. Ryle, the great 19th century preacher. And he turns, sitting with his daughter for this first time to read her a story, he turns to the first story, and it's called The Two Bears. And he thinks to himself, amazing. Wow, it's probably a Christian spin on Goldilocks and the Three Bears. This is going to be delightful. And he begins the story and quickly reads, Elisha cursing these boys and bears mauling the children. And then J.C. Ryle follows it up and says, Dear children, have you ever seen a bear? And there he is, you know, sitting there on the rocking chair with his newborn daughter, and he's troubled. He's like, what do I do? She's not going to remember this, but I'm always going to remember this. The first story I ever read to my daughter, and here it is. What do I do with this? And it actually caused this new dad to ask himself some important questions. Like, should I move to the next story? Or he started to think a little bit deeper. Do I want my daughter to see a legacy of her watching me skip through the awkward parts of the Bible? Or will I teach her that all of Scripture is God-breathed? You know, as parents, we must be wise about when to offer certain details, as I will attempt to do this morning. But listen to me. Far be it from us as parents to give our children a half Bible. Amen? Far be it from us to skip the stories of warning, to skip the stories of difficulty. What our children need, what we all need, is a whole Bible. It's all been given to us by God. It's all important. And this text is included in that. And so I would argue that studying the most troubling texts in the Bible actually helps grow the trustworthiness of it in our minds and love for it is we don't need to avoid these, but always be questioning these weird texts in the back of our minds. Let's dive right in. Let's look at this story this morning, okay? And like we said, kids are in the service, and hopefully you've got paper, kids, and crayons, because I, this is becoming a tradition of ours. I've got a whole bunch of candy, a whole bunch of chocolates for you, and if you show me a picture you've drawn Somehow from this sermon this morning, I've got treats for you, okay? There is a young boy with a red crayon in the room that's just ready to go to town, right? I look forward to seeing that piece of art, okay? Um, But let me lay out where we're going, kids. uh, There's really three scenes. There's three points to the sermon, and there are three distinct scenes from our text this morning. So let me explain what they are. You can draw any of them or all of them. I had a couple like comic book style pictures from kids this morning where they, all the scenes were, it was incredible. Looking forward to what you've got, kids. First point and first scene in our text this morning is a foretaste of the Savior. And the location where that happens is verses 13 and 14 at the Jordan River. There's a scenario that happens at the Jordan River. That's the first scene, okay? Okay. Then our second point is a foretaste of paradise, and that takes place in a city called Jericho that you may have heard of. The second scene happens in Jericho, and it's a miracle that happens there. The third scene is a foretaste of judgment, and it is a scenario that happens in a city called Bethel, and it involves some bears, okay? So that's where we're going this morning. Let's start with the first. A foretaste of the Savior, God with us is what we see here. Now, just to get us up to speed, last summer we did a summer sermon series, mostly in 1 Kings, that got us to the beginning of 2 Kings, and it was on the prophet Elijah. And we're in a transitional moment here where the baton is being passed from Elijah the prophet to Elisha the prophet. So last summer we looked at Elijah. This summer we're in 2 Kings looking at Elisha. And in 1 and 2 Kings, Elijah and Elisha are spirit-empowered prophets who walk with God, represent God, and show the way to covenant faithfulness toward God through their words and the deeds that they do. And we get a front row seat to some of that this morning. So as the summer goes along, 
Church, you're actually going to see more and more how Elisha's spirit-empowered ministry points forward to the spirit-empowered ministry of Jesus and what it means for Jesus' followers like us to live in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. You're going to see the baton pass this morning and spirit-empowered ministry by Elisha right out of the gate. And that's meant to foreshadow. It's meant to be a foretaste of Jesus and the church. Now, things concluded last summer with Elisha asking Elijah for a double portion of his spirit. So that's before our text, but it's in 2 Kings 2 verse 9. And that language seems odd. He's There with Elijah, Elijah's like, ask me what you want. And Elisha's like, a double portion of your spirit, please. And that's odd language, but we need to understand that that's actually firstborn language. He's using the language of firstborn that usually had to do with portion of land and wealth. But in this case, it's neither of those things. What he's asking for is a double portion of prophetic power. He's going to take over from Elijah the prophet, and Elisha is essentially saying that he will commit himself to succeed Elijah as prophet in Israel, but he only asked that the Spirit of God would be with him in it. And then, verse 11, again, just before our text, something incredible happens. After Elisha asks that of Elijah, um, chariots and horses of fire somehow separate Elijah from Elisha, and a whirlwind comes around, and a whirlwind takes up Elijah into heaven. And at that point, Elisha tears his garment, and now we've arrived at our text. And it picks up like this, and it says, and he took up the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him, right? He's ripped his own cloak, but now he takes up Elijah's cloak and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. The way they had gotten to that location in the first place was Elijah parted the Jordan River, and they walked through, and now they're on the other side. And now Elisha takes up the garment of Elijah, having just, he's just gone up into the heavens in a whirlwind, and here's what happens. Then he took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he had struck the water, the water was parted to the one side and to the other, and Elisha went over. Now, Elisha not only takes up the cloak of Elijah, Elisha takes up the mantle of Elijah. And as he takes that up, he, puts, he, he makes this declaring statement, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And as he does, the Jordan River parts for Elisha. And he walks through. The answer to his question, where is the Lord, after Elijah the prophet has left him, is obvious. The God of Elijah is now demonstrably with his successor, Elisha. Now, I want you to kind of see this interesting story in the context of the scriptures at large, the big storyline of the Bible. A lot is going on here. Elijah parted the sea like Moses. Now Elisha, like Joshua, who also crossed the Jordan and entered the land of Israel near Jericho, does the same. The text is telling us that Elisha is the new Joshua, just as Elijah was the new Moses. And one of the ways that we see this is actually in their names. Joshua means God of salvation. Elisha means my God is salvation. Joshua, Yeshua, Jesus is also the same name. So Jesus' name is also God is salvation. So let's pull all of this together. Not only is Joshua, uh, Elisha the new Joshua, in another sense we could say that John the Baptist was the greater Elijah and and Jesus the greater Elisha. Are you tracking with me? This is big Bible themes kind of stuff here. John came dressed like Elijah in the, and was this wilderness guy, and there at the Jordan anointed his successor at the Jordan. But instead of the river opening like it does for Elisha, what happens? The heavens open. As John the Baptist is declaring his successor, the heavens open up. And where Elisha has asked for a double portion, we have the Spirit descending on Jesus like a dove, and God the Father declaring, this is my son, my firstborn son whom I love. As you'll see throughout the summer, 
Elisha not only succeeds Elijah, he will exceed him as the spirit-empowered prophet. And so too does Jesus succeed and exceed John the Baptist as the spirit-empowered son of God. Like Elisha, Jesus has command over the water. In fact, the water will rage against him and he will say, be still, and the water will listen. Jesus, unlike Elijah, doesn't, won't escape death by ascension. But Jesus himself will actually go through death so that he can defeat it before he ascends. So kids, if you're drawing this picture and you've got Josh or Elisha, got to keep everybody straight here. You got Elisha parting the Jordan River. There's also kind of a side picture that it's a pointer to that you could draw, which is Jesus being baptized in the Jordan River. And instead of the river opening up, the skies are opening up, the spirit is present and God's saying, firstborn, firstborn. The parallels are so rich. And so I want you to see Jesus in this story of Elisha. In the same way that um, just as Elisha watched Elijah ascend into the heavens and then discovered that even though Elijah had left him, God's presence remained with him, disciples of Jesus would later watch as Jesus ascended into heaven, and he, like Elijah, left his spirit with us. Yes, Elijah left, but Elisha goes on to say, where are you, God? And the answer is, I'm with you. Jesus ascended. What are the disciples of Jesus to say? Where are you, God? No, we say, I'm with you. That's, he declares that he is with us. Jesus ascended, but he sent his spirit to indwell and animate the lives of his followers to comfort you. The spirit of God lives in you. When you are feeling discouraged, when you are feeling down, the comfort of the Holy Spirit or the assurance of the Spirit's presence works as an assurance of salvation when you are feeling discouraged. But not only that, the Spirit indwelling us as he did Elisha is to empower us for the ministry that God's called us to, that he's assigned to us until he returns. The Spirit of God Although Elijah went up into the heavens, his spirit remained with Elisha. Although Jesus has ascended into the heavens, his spirit remains with you. And us, like Elisha, are given a job to do, ministry to do. Now we get this interesting interlude in verse 15, where it says, now when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho saw him opposite them, they said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. In other words, these uh, individuals in Jericho have watched as this whirlwind has taken up Elijah, and then they see Elisha take on the mantle of leadership and part the sea. And so they're like, wow, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And then they came to meet Elisha and bowed to the ground before him. And they said to him, behold, now there are with your servants, 50 strong men. Please let them go and seek your master. Let them go find Elijah somewhere because it may be that the spirit of the Lord has caught him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. And he said, you shall not send. No, no. It's a fool's errand. You're not going to find him. No, no, don't do it. But when they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, send. Honor, shame, culture. They pushed it too far. He's like, fine, go. You're embarrassing me and yourselves. And so they sent therefore 50 men. And for three days, they sought him, but did not find him. And Elisha's like, yeah, duh. Like I watched him go up into the heavens. And they came back to him. And while he was staying at Jericho, he said to them, did I not say to you, don't go? This is a really strange scenario, but essentially it's one long paragraph where Elisha's saying, told you so. So let's move on to the next scene. All right, a foretaste of paradise. What we're gonna see here is a reverse of the curse. We'll get into what that means. So here's the second scene, kids. It happens in a city called Jericho. Now, the men of Jericho said to Elisha, behold, the situation of this city is pleasant as my Lord sees, but the water is bad and the land unfruitful. He said, Elisha said, bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. So they brought it to him, and then he went to the spring of the water and threw salt in it and said, thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From now on, neither death nor miscarriage shall come from it. So the water has been healed to this day, according to the word that Elisha spoke. Okay, what in the world does this mean? It's a strange miracle. 
A new bowl and salt is not going to repair a spring that is poisoning people and the agriculture. It is a a miraculous work of God. But I need you to see that there's more going on under the surface. During uh, the conquest, during Joshua's day, the Israelites marched around this city of Jericho, marched around its walls, and the walls came a-tumbling down. You know this. And they devoted that city to destruction, everybody but Rahab and, his fa- and her family. They were spared. Everything else was devoted to destruction. And at that time, we see in Joshua 6 that Joshua pronounced a curse on Jericho. It says this, Joshua 6, 26, Joshua laid an oath on them at that time saying, cursed before the Lord be the man who rises up and rebuilds this city, Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn shall he lay its foundation and at the cost of his youngest son shall he set up its gates. Uh, Jericho, um, being the first Canaanite city to fall, was to be left in ruin. Okay, so that's what's going on. They cross the Jordan River. Jericho's the first city that they take. It's, it's leveled to the ground, and Joshua curses the city, says, let no one rebuild it. Why? Because it was meant to be a symbol of God's righteous judgment on Canaan. Now, we've got kids in the room, so I'm not going to get into detail, but if you can think of the most reprehensible things that could be done Those are the kinds of things that the Canaanites were doing. And so God was not only bringing his chosen people, the Israelites, into this land of promise, he was simultaneously using it as judgment upon the Canaanites for their wickedness. And Jericho is the first city that's overthrown. And Jericho curses that city and says, let no one rebuild it. Let it be a symbol that people would look over at its destruction and see that it stands as a symbol of God's righteous judgment on Canaan. But later on, we read in 1 Kings 16 that a man named Heel eventually rebuilt Jericho and did so at the cost of two of his sons. The text says he laid its foundations at the cost of his firstborn and set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son. So there's a little bit of backstory about Jericho. And so what's going on in our text is that some form of water pollution is threatening both life and productivity in Jericho, and I would say it's likely a residual effect of the curse on Jericho. But what we're about to witness, or what we've just read, and we'll read it again, is a reverse of that curse. And that's hugely symbolic in the scriptures. These residents of Jericho receive God's prophet. They embrace Elisha. They note that God's spirit rests on him. By embracing Elisha, they are showing a trust and a receiving of God himself. And what follows is a reverse of the curse. The water is bad, they tell him, and the land is unfruitful. So Elisha tells him to bring a bowl and salt, and he pours it in. He says, thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From now on, neither death nor miscarriage shall come from it. See, as Elisha takes over from Elijah, it's clear that God is still speaking. And his word is still ordering the life of his people. What's clear is that the water that was making people very sick is purified now by the word of the Lord. Now we saw in the first section that even though Elijah had gone, God's presence was still with Elisha. Now we see that even though Elijah is gone, God is not silent, but he continues to speak. And through Elisha, God performs this miracle. And miracles have like a double kind of purpose in the Bible. One is redempt- it's redemptive. They're always redemptive. They restore, they rectify. But secondly, because they restore to wholeness, miracles point toward the future and anticipate the new heavens and the new earth. They're meant to be a picture of, of something much more significant than the miracle itself. And in healing the waters at Jericho, we have a foretaste of the restoration of paradise and the removal of the curse to which creation was subjected through sin. So kids, if you're drawing this second scene, you've got this scenario in Jericho where the water's being purified, but it's symbolic of a reversal of a curse much bigger It's a picture of the new heavens and the new earth when one day everything will be restored, creation included. Romans 8.20 says, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, 
but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. That's the promise to come. But in Jericho, there's a little picture of that vision. This polluted water is cleansed. It no longer causes death. It actually brings life. It's a picture that we read about in Revelation 22, So here's the better image, kids. It's not just this little miracle in Jericho, stunning as that is. It's a picture of the end of the Bible, Revelation 22, where it says, then the angel showed me, this is a vision that John the apostle saw, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month, the The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. Here's what we learn from these believers in Jericho. Those who seek and call on the Lord will get him, his grace, renewal, and ultimately restoration. Just to bring this into the room a bit more, uh, Jericho was going through the human experience, right? We, we read that um, Jericho was pleasant on the one hand and bad and unfruitful on the other. Doesn't that sound like your life? Pleasant on the one hand, bad and unfruitful on the other. Every one of us in the room right now could write a list of things going well in our lives. And every one of us could write a list of things not going well in our lives. Jericho is a picture of the human experience. It's it's pleasing to the eye. There's some good stuff. There's some pleasant stuff, but there's some stuff that's bad. There's some unfruitful things. There's some hardships here as well. There's signs of decay in the human life, sin breaking into the human experience. Yes, there's the good, but there's also the difficult. So just Apply this to your life. And I want you to see that Jericho is this mini miracle that reminds us of the hope that awaits us in Jesus. Your life is full of blessing and it's full of things that are leading to decay and death. But here's the truth for the Christian. Hope is coming. Restoration is coming. Every wrong will eventually be made right. Every sorrow will turn to joy. Or as J.R.R. Token beautifully put it, all the sad things will one day come untrue. And so if you're feeling in the room a little more heavy than you are the pleasant, if you're feeling the bad and the decaying more than you're feeling the pleasant, I just want you to hear, it's not always how it will be. Jericho, that miracle in Jericho of turning tainted water into living water is a picture of what you get in Jesus. You will one day be fully restored. Everything will be made new for you. All right, let's look at this final scene. And we see that it's actually a foretaste of judgment for us. Where, where there was a foretaste of the reverse of the curse, what we're seeing here is a foretaste of judgment having to do with bearing the curse. See what I did there? Highlight of my week was crafting that little line. Felt really good about it. I live a very sad life. <laughs> Nerding out on that. Okay, let's get to the story. 2 Kings 2.23. This is the really challenging bit of our text this morning. He went up, that's Elisha, went up from there to Bethel. And while he was going up on the way, some small boys came out of the city and jeered at him, saying, go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. And he turned around, and when he saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two she-bears came out of the woods and tore 42 of the boys. From there, he went on to Mount Carmel, and from there, he returned to Samaria. I have three, like, major questions about what I just read. One is, are these small boys? Are these little guys? Second, are they actually making a bald joke, or is something else going on? Should I stop making bald jokes, I guess, is my big question. Third... Isn't Elisha's response like super extreme, like way over the top? 
the punishment not meeting the crime? I mean, those are big questions I have, right? Let's look at those. First, I would argue it's more likely, it's most likely that these were young men, not little boys. I'm not just trying to change the story on you. I think this is one of the worst Bible translation instances in, in, the, whole, in the whole Bible. Um, the Hebrew word, there's actually a different Hebrew word used most often in the Hebrew Bible for children, not used here. Why not? Like, why wouldn't you use it? Um, the word that's used here refers to, has various meanings. And so interpreters have, translators have to make a decision. Who is this? Um, because this Hebrew word can refer to size, it can refer to age. It can also refer to status, like the level of importance of somebody. And so it can refer, actually, it was common for it to refer to not yet married men. This same word is a, a way to describe those. It's a way to describe men who are seen as relatively insignificant, like eighth in the birth order. Sorry, eighth in the birth order. There's like eight of you here, and it's It was like lowest, hey, let me show you a few. Um, for example, David, before he goes and defeats Goliath, this word is used of him. You know, Samuel comes, like all that kind of stuff. And it's like looking at all these brothers, but there's a younger brother. But he's tending sheep and he's actually like defending sheep from bears and lions at that point. He's not seven. He's just insignificant. He's just late in the birth order. He's forgotten. He's like, here's my oldest son's. But there's this little boy, but it just means the younger brother, and yet he's one who could not only defend the sheep from lions and bears, he could defeat Goliath. Psalm 115, 13 says, he will bless those who fear the Lord, both small and great. Same word, small, that's the same word that's used in our text today. And I don't think that's a reference, doesn't naturally read as a reference to young and old, it's more of a Significant or insignificant, it reads. Isaiah 36, verse 9. How then can you repulse a single captain among the least, there's our word, of my master's servants when you trust in Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? We're talking about the captain of an army and we're talking about the least of his soldiers. Not young boys, just lower rank. See, this word can mean young men, it can mean subordinates. So not only were these likely young men there were more than 42 of them because 42 of them were torn apart by bears. So rather than like a group of preschoolers in a line all holding on to a rope and one of them yells a bald joke and they all get mauled by a bear, what we should have in mind is a dangerous mob of young men mocking God's prophet. The verse tells us, we don't really know if they died or not. The verse tells us the bears tore them and that sense there is to maul, uh, to injure badly by beating, clawing, biting, or tearing. Okay, I think these are young men. Second, it's actually not clear what these young men mean when they yell, go up, you bald head. We don't know what they're meaning, what they're referring to with Elijah. There's, there's three kind of common views. One is when they say go up, it's either a way of saying leave town, get out of here. Or second, they're saying go up, like go up to the high place at Bethel, which was a place of idol worship. So they're saying to God's prophet, go worship the idol. Or third, they're saying go up, like go up the way of Elijah, your predecessor. Die. Die. One of those options has to do with him telling God's prophet to worship an idol. The other two, and this is most likely, are telling him he's not wanted in Bethel. They're rejecting God's prophet. What does bald head mean? It's also tough to interpret. Elisha may have shaved his head as an act of mourning for Elijah. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Micah, and Amos all reference God instructing Israel to shave their heads as an act of mourning. Alternatively, Elisha might have just been bald, and so it was low-hanging fruit for them. In light of, or it could be third, in light of the fact that Elijah was quite hairy, there's a reference to that, they're trying to be like, you're not his successor. They're trying to belittle him. You're not Elijah's successor. He was hairy, you're bald. They're trying to show distinction that like leaves like, no, 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 you're not God's man. I'm not sure, to be honest, which one it is, but before we get to whether or not it was an extreme overreaction by Elisha, let's pause and assess where we are. 
This was not the fun-loving teasing from little boys. This was an aggressive mob of young men, dangerous for Elijah, and mocking God's prophet. Now, we think of this as like, well, the punishment doesn't meet the crime, right? Mocking, but actually the Bible depicts mocking almost uniformly as the action of the ungodly for two reasons. One, in mocking, we ridicule those who have been made in the image of God. And second, therefore, ridicule the God who made them. If you tear somebody down, you're tearing someone down who bears the image of God. The pinnacle of creation, God's creation, you are tearing down when you mock. Not only that, you're ridiculing the God who made them and made them in his image. It's what James 3 is saying when it says, with the tongue we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse the people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not be so. You ought not live that way. Don't worship God with your mouth and tear down and mock when you leave the church service or whatever it is. Jesus goes on to say, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Or as the old saying goes, you kiss your mother with that mouth, right? They're saying you worship God with your mouth and then you curse those who are made in the image of God. How is that possible? That ought not be It's a reference to the fact that our words are powerful and Jesus is connecting our words with our hearts, revealing where we're really at. And so for these young men, as they mock God's prophet, they're actually revealing that they reject God. They want nothing to do with him. Go up, you bald man. Get out of here, God's prophet. You're not welcome. Can I press this a little bit more? Bethel is actually ground zero for idolatry in 1 and 2 Kings. Bethel, when it just says the word Bethel in our text, it's an indicator. This is a place of idolatry. These young men, you know what they're doing? They're leaning into the sins of their fathers in that moment. It's a place of idolatry. Their dads are idolatrous priests. And these young men are merely mimicking the very words they heard mom and dad using in the kitchen, mocking God, pursuing idols. Look, for the parents in the room or for anybody who mentors younger people, listen, this is, this is, this is challenging for us, isn't it? Like The reality is they hear us, they see us. They note what we treasure most. They note when we love God, adore God, pursue God, and when we pursue worthless idols. They watch it all. They hear our talk. They mimic it and they say it too. That's why sometimes my kids say things and I go, ah, I wish my wife hadn't said those things, you know, because that's, that's how it works. You know, I'm a pastor. I obviously, everything is holy. I I take this to heart. Like, I take all of this to heart. I think one of the biggest sins in my life that the Lord has been sanctifying me in, and I pray continues to sanctify me in, is, is my sharp tongue. I love to tease, but I love to tease with sarcasm, and sometimes it's sharp. I tell people in my life, I only tease those I love, and then, ooh, that one stung. The Lord has sanctified me a lot in that, but I need him to do that all the more. See, the mocking of God that happened in the home turned into mocking God's prophet, by the way, was this, it just built into this rejection of God wholesale. And it's a reminder to us. It's a reminder to us that the wages of sin is death. That's sin's reward. I wonder, are we glorifying sin, minimizing sin, loose with our tongues, saying very harmful things rather than seeing sin and these kinds of words as an affront to a holy God? Look, we are all sinners. We all need redemption. The question is, do we repent of our sin? Do we love God? Fail God, yes, but love God. Turn to God, repent of sin. Ask for the forgiveness of those in our lives that we have harmed with our words and with our actions. Do we recognize our desperate need for a savior? For without him, we are those who will be judged by God. We need the gospel. 
Look, as we wrap, start to wrap up here, we need to recognize again in the story of the Bible, Israel mocked her prophets and God judged his people by the destruction of Jerusalem and sending them into exile. Second Chronicles 36 records the decline of Israel's faithfulness to God and says in verse 16, the Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them by his messengers, the prophets, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people until there was no remedy. So that's why in verse 26, we are told, or 24, that Elisha cursed them in the name of the Lord. He's not swearing at them. He's announcing a covenant curse upon them. He turned around and when he saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two she-bears came out of the woods and tore 42 of the boys. What Elisha is doing here, like the rest of the Old Testament prophets in pronouncing curses, was this. Issuing divine warning intended to alert the people to their waywardness in the hope that they would return to following God. To curse was to warn, danger, don't go that way. Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 formally catalog um, the blessings for obedience and the punishment for disobedience. And in both contexts, you know what the most severe curse is? They, they, They ratchet up and the most severe covenant curse in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 is invasion by foreign enemies and exile from the land. And in that catalog of punishments for for failing to follow God's instruction is this interesting verse in Leviticus 26. It says, so it's ratcheting up. It's not yet exile and banishment from the land, but it's this. Then if you walk contrary to me and will not listen to me, I will let loose the wild beasts against you which shall bereave you of your children, destroy your livestock, and make you few in number, so that your roads shall be deserted. Now, if you were to read all of Leviticus 26, this verse like stands out as odd. Kind of like our text does. It's like mauled by bears? Like where did that come from? When compared with the other covenant curses, the curse of being attacked by wild animals seems really strange and out of place. So what should we make of it? Well, one way to make sense of it is to see it in the larger story of the Bible. So let's, let's sort of zoom out again. As it, we can see this scenario as an undoing of the blessing given to human beings by God at creation and then repeated multiple times again to Abraham. Let me explain that. In Genesis 1.28, it says, and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. The command to rule over animal life is actually in keeping with that purpose, which is to be fruitful and multiply and to fill the earth. Genesis 1.28 situates the command to rule over the animal realm in close connection with human population growth. Leviticus 26 contrasts that with wild animals leading to decrease in population, bereaved, made few, desolate roads. It's a reverse of, of 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 the command The curse of bereavement at the hands of wild animals seems to represent a reversal of the blessing given to human beings at creation and in some ways suspending the covenant promise to Abraham that Israel would become a great nation as numerous as the stars. It seems these wild beasts seem to be putting a halt to that and actually dwindling numbers, not growing numbers, meaning one would need to come who could break the curse. Kids, who might that be? Right. Well done. All right. Well done, adults. <laughs> All right, we're almost done, I promise. See, whereas the people of Jericho responded to Elisha in faith and received God's blessing, the people of Bethel respond in unbelief, rejecting Elisha and God's spirit upon him and receive God's judgment. So, I want to talk about Jesus as we close, but listen, I'm wondering at this point, does this text still leave a bad taste in your mouth? 
Do God and his prophet Elisha seem to be going overboard with sicking bears on boys? I don't think so for two reasons. One is warning. This is a ratcheted up warning, and it's specifically in a city of Baal worship. It is a warning. Turn from your sin. Repent. Turn to God. It's a warning. I don't think it's unjust. Here's the second reason. Jesus. I don't think it's unjust because Jesus. Another prophet would come who would also be mocked. And the mocking will once again be focused on his head, this time with a crown of thorns being placed upon it. And instead of being told to go up twice, like Elisha, the mockers will tell Jesus, who's hanging on the cross, two times, they'll tell him to come down. Come down from the cross if you're the Messiah. But instead of the mocker's bodies being torn at that point, the prophet's body is torn. Not only is he mocked, he is the one torn. And this prophet, even in the midst of persecution, will show that he's a gracious prophet who would tell one of his mockers who turns and repents that he will be with him in paradise that very day. And then from that cross, as his body had been torn and as the mockers had mocked, he prayed a prayer for the forgiveness of every other one of them. The boys and the bears was to serve as a warning to Israel and call them to repentance. The boys and the bears was a symbol of divine punishment for sin. And the boys and the bears foreshadowed our Savior, who, though being the one mocked and scorned, also bore the punishment upon himself so that we could get grace. So kids, in this third and final scene, yes, we have bears, but it's actually a foreshadow of the cross where Jesus was the one torn so that our sins could be forgiven. And so I hope the way that applies to you in the room is this. Your mocking of God, your mocking of others has not gone so far. Your parenting has not been so bad. Your choices have not been so idolatrous that there is not grace for you today. The beauty of the gospel is that the boys and the bears is a warning. The cross where Jesus is the one torn is held out to you. It's his mercy towards you. It's his grace. He bore the wrath so that you could get grace. Will you receive it? Will you live into it? Let me pray. Jesus, I thank you for your word, and I mean that. I thank you for all the scripture and confess all scripture to be God-breathed. We believe that, Lord even the troubling bits, even the challenging texts. And Lord, I hope for us this morning as as we just take a glimpse and, and really not nearly enough time, but we take time to look at one of these troubling texts, the gospel is written all over it. Redemption is written all over it. Restoration is written all over it. Lord, would we see that? Would we heed the warnings about our sin? And would we turn to you for grace? Pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.